That's good. You remember the book of Acts at Philippi? You remember what the apostles were doing? At midnight. Singing praises to God. Amen. The one the Philippian jailer over, I'll tell you that. That's good singing. That's a good song. Amen. Well, I tell you what, if you have your Bible, turn with me tonight to the Gospel of Luke. Luke, the beloved physician, chapter 9. Luke chapter 9 and verse number 27. Luke 9, 27. But I tell you of a truth. There be some standing here which shall not taste of death, this is important, till they see the kingdom of God. And it came to pass about an eight days after these sayings, he took Peter and John and James and went up into a mountain to pray. And as he prayed, the fashion of his countenance was altered. His raiment was white and glistening, glistering, rather, glistering. And behold, there talked with him two men, which were Moses and Elias, who appeared in glory and spake of his decease, which he should accomplish at, ex at Jerusalem. Father, bless this book now. Thy name I pray, amen. That word for decease is exodus, to depart, you see. This is important now because I'm going to try to show you some things tonight that uh, if nothing else, so you'll leave here thinking. And I love to think. I love to get in a quandary where I don't know the answer. It forces me to do a lot of praying about it. Sometimes I never get the answer, but I know the answer, don't you? Christ is the answer. Whether you understand everything about him or not, and I don't think any of us really do understand. He's a mystery, and he's the mystery of God manifest in the flesh. Now what you have here are these apostles being taken to the top of a mountain. We don't know which one it was. Some say Hermon. Seems to be a lot that say that. Mount Hermon is in the north, and uh, it's in Lebanon. And the waters from Hermon flow down, and they come out at uh, Caesarea Benias. And there they bubble up and create the Jordan River and flow all the way down south into the Dead Sea. And it was there the Lord said to his disciples, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Moses, Elijah, so forth. But who do you say that I am? And that's where the Apostle Peter said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed that to you, but my Father which is in heaven. No man knows the Father but the Son. No man knows the Son but the Father. You understand the reciprocal understanding and identification of the Father and the Son. We know about the Son. We have our concept of Him. But the Bible says without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. I believe that. No question in my mind. But I can no more define everything about Christ than I can define everything about God. Amen. Because you can't do it. It's a mystery, but I believe it. But now we have a mountain. I wonder which one they went to. Well, you remember the Apostle Paul in the book of Galatians says, Immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood, but I was taken off into Arabia. And there God began to reveal to him the heart and soul, the basis and foundation of the doctrine of the New Testament church. He got that in Arabia. Now Mount Sinai, Jebel Musa is what they call it. Musa is Moses. Jebel is the mountain of Moses is what the Arabs call it. And a lot of people believe that that's Sinai. Now, you know what Sinai is. You know that's where the law was given. And Moses went to top of that mountain. And there he met with God. I don't know which mountain, but it's intriguing to think tonight that he took them to Sinai, isn't it? It's intriguing to think that the Apostle Paul had revealed to him the mystery of the body of Christ and the foundational doctrines of the New Testament church from Sinai. Who else went to the top of Sinai? Wouldn't it, it uh, Moses went up there? Who's that other one? Who? Yeah, Joshua. All right. Well, what happened to Elijah when he went off into the wilderness? He went up into a mountain, didn't he? He sure did. He went up into a mountain. Well, we have Moses and Elijah here. And they're in a mountain. Now, whether it's Mount Sinai or not, you don't press the point. I mean, some things like that you said, okay, it may be. But it's interesting. 
It's interesting to think that the law was given at Sinai, that the Apostle Paul was given the foundational doctrines of the New Testament church at Sinai, and the Lord Jesus Christ was revealed, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased at Sinai. But I'm not saying that's so. But you can't say it ain't so either. <laughs> Bible's a good book, folks. Now, what are Moses and Elijah doing here? They've been dead. Moses died 1,400 years before this. 1,400 years. Elijah's along about 500 or so. What, how, come there, how come these dead men are showing up on top of this mountain? Because this is not a resurrection. No resurrection has taken place. Somebody said, well, the dead do not come back. Oh, no. Well, Samuel came back. And he was raised out of, uh, out of uh, paradise at that time, Abraham's bosom. And if you notice here, this is before Christ died on the cross and was buried and rose again the third day. And the apostle tells us in Ephesians, when he rose, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. That meant that he emptied paradise. The apostle Peter talks about it in 1 Peter chapter number 3. Verses 18 through 21, he talks about the visit that Christ made down to the heart of the earth. There's something going on here, don't you think? Now, here's something else you need to understand. These two men existed, didn't they? Yeah. These are not apparitions. These aren't ghosts. These aren't some kind of a, you know, fabrication, a, 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 what is it called? An impersonating demon, a familiar spirit. They're not familiar spirits. This is Moses and this is Elijah. Now, when Moses came, he came to lead, lead the children of Israel out of Egypt, didn't he? He sure did. He led them out. He was 80 years old when he showed up before Pharaoh. And that's when his ministry started and lasted 40 years. He led them out of Egypt. Well, the children of Israel needs to be led out of Egypt now. Elijah showed up for them to determine who God was. Elijah. Elohim is Jehovah. That's what his name means. So look at this, what we have. We've got two powerful figures here. We've got Moses and we've got Elijah. And they're both meeting with the Lord Jesus Christ on top of this mountain. Now that's quite a thing. Here at the end of the message, I'll give you some, some things too to, for you to consider uh, as, as right before you leave the house tonight. I would love for you to go home and start scratching your head. What that preacher say? Why did he say that? What's going on here to get you thinking? I'd love to do that. Amen. Amen. This is a big deal, folks. Moses and Elijah show up. They're fully alive. They're not in the same body they were in when they died. For the body that they're in now is an entirely different body. You might say a glorified body. When the Lord Jesus Christ arose from the dead, he could walk through walls and eat fish. He could. He could appear just exactly like one of us and then just disappear. Why? Because he was in a glorified body. That's why. A body that could never die again. He died one time. He'll never die again. There's absolutely no need whatsoever in crucifying Christ every Sunday morning and having some kind of a mass. You know, perpetual sacrifice. That's not necessary. He died one time, one time, one time to bear the sins of the world. We don't need to put him to death every Sunday. So the Lord Jesus Christ is here on top of this mountain, Peter, James, and John. But I want you to notice the context of it. Luke chapter number 9 and verse 28 says, It came to pass after about an eight days. Anytime the word eight number shows up in the Bible, eight, it means there's something about to start. There's a new beginning. Seven is perfection. Eight, therefore, starts a new beginning. You know the gematria of the name of Christ is 888. Eight, eight. New beginning, new beginning, new beginning. Man's number is 666. Six, six. Six, six, six. And when the man of sin shows up, he will be, he will be attached to the number 666 six, six, and he can't get away from it. God, God will, will identify him through that number 666. Six, six. So the Bible says here that his, 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 his raiment was glistering and Moses and Elijah showed up. And then they talked about his decease, which he should notice the word accomplish at Jerusalem. Isn't that amazing? Accomplish the Bible says the same tribulations or the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. You ever thought about that? The same. There are those that preach to you that, you know, if you have enough faith, you'll never get sick. You have enough faith, you'll never hurt. You have enough faith, you'll never break any bones. But folks, I, I, I don't want to embarrass anybody, but you'd be surprised at how many of them, when they get sick, they get clandestine ambulance shows up and hauls them off to the doctor somewhere. But they never let you know it. Because it goes against their doctrine. 
No, the Bible says the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. Accomplished means that it is something that must be done and paid for. That is one of our testimonies and witnesses to this lost and dying world when they see you cough like they do and you hurt like they do, yet you retain your faith in God that he was singing about just a moment ago through the hard time. So Luke chapter number nine is a powerful, powerful scripture. Notice carefully that you've got life after death. They're alive. These, these two are alive. These are real men, folks. And these are men that had been dead and now they're walking around on earth or standing on top of a mountain. You know, I, sometimes I'm afraid to say some things, but I've told you this before and I'll tell you again because it's important. And I don't know that I have the answer to it. But one of my aunts was killed in Chicago. She died in Chicago. I'm uncertain how she died. She was a young woman. I was living with my grandfather on Beaumont Avenue. That night about midnight, he said he got up and heard a sound. He went to the door and he saw her standing in the middle of Beaumont, my aunt, but she was dead in Chicago. And the next morning when we got the word about it, that's what he told him. And I have no reason to doubt my grandfather. He, doesn't, he didn't make things up. That was his daughter, and he saw her standing there. So what was that? I don't know that I have all the answers, but I know this. Everything is not cut and dried. Everything's not black and white. Everything is not simplicity. The Bible is a real book talking about a real world, a spiritual world, and a physical world. And notice in the context here, he says that, uh, that this is the kingdom of God, verse 27, which shall not taste of death till they see the kingdom of God. Did you know the kingdom of God is in this house tonight because it's full of born again believers. And since it's full of born again believers, it has holy, the Holy Spirit is in every last one of you that are born again. Satan's job is to keep the Holy Spirit quietened, muffled, covered up, blind, you know, somehow or another limit, tie up. But the problem is he's trying to tie God up. And he's not going to be able to do that, but he'll put his deceit, his deceit upon you. The wiles of Satan. I want you to notice the second thing. Moses was still Moses and Elijah was still Elijah. They hadn't changed. Now, they weren't angels or cherubim. You see, you, a lot of people think, well, you know, when you die, you become an angel. Remember what I've said about the word angel. The word angel is a far, far more complicated term in the Bible than simply a created being that, uh, that, that's, that, 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 that follows the rule or the, or the direction or command of God. The word angel has much broader meaning. So the Bible says here that it was Moses and Elijah. And the third thing I want you to notice about it, they were conscious and they weren't sleeping, soul sleep. Now there's a lot of people out here and they're good people. I don't question that. Man, you can believe a lot of different things and still be saved. How many believe that? <laughs> How many, how, many, how many since you got saved have, and this is going to affect your pride now, buckle up. How many of you since you got saved have changed your position on a few things? Raise your hand. <laughs> Better believe it. <laughs> Lord, teach me, open mine eyes and show me. And I'm the first one to admit that before you tonight. So... They weren't sleeping in the ground, no soul sleep, to be absent from, the, absent from the bodies, to be in the graveyard, right? To be absent from the bodies, what? Present with the Lord. Have a desire to part and be with Christ, which is far, far better. Now, I want you to notice the fourth thing about it. They were in glorified bodies, could suddenly appear and disappear. There's no indication here that Elijah left in a chariot of fire. There's no indication here that Moses or anything like that. But when they were here during their lifetime, they had unique lives. Nobody knows how Moses died and they don't know where he's buried. But we know what happened to Elijah. But nobody had that happen before in a sense. He was caught up in a chariot of fire. And Elisha watched him go up. And as he went up, something fell down to the earth. That's right. The mantle. The indication of anointing. The prophetic office and power. He picked it up, took it to the Jordan River, smote it and says, where's the Lord God of Elijah? And that river stopped, opened right up for him. Amen. Why? Because Elijah was a prophet of prophets. That's why. 
He was, or he wouldn't be on top of this mountain with the Lord. And Moses was Moses, and there's only one Moses. He's on top of this mountain with the Lord. I want you to notice something else. They're coming to talk to the Lord Jesus about something that's going to happen on this earth. Not in heaven, but down here. They talked about his death that he should accomplish in Jerusalem. Now that in itself is an entirely different message, but I just want you to think about it tonight. He died not a martyr's death. He died as the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. And God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them. That was never before nor since. There's only one qualified for that to happen. And that was the Lord Jesus Christ. So the last thing about Moses and Elijah is this. It's evident that they enjoyed fellowship with each other. Though they lived hundreds and hundreds of years apart. And of course it's always said, well how did they know it was Moses and how did they know it was Elijah? Same way I know I'm saved. Holy Ghost is in me. Spirit of God which was in them did testify the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow, Peter said. And these, these wise men sought and wanted to know, and the deep things of the Lord to reveal, shall he do anything except he reveal it to his servants, the prophets. God will show you what he wants you to know. And he'll raise a red flag when you get around the wrong spirit. No question about that. Don't doubt that one bit. And it's so important as a Christian that you try the spirits, not what they're saying, but what they are. And your first impression is usually your right one. Have you ever been around somebody who just seemed to repel? It just, they, they, they talk right, look right, but there's, there's just something about them that's just not right. And this is what's going on here. These two fellowshiped with each other, Moses and Elijah. Well, I'm going to tell you something. When I get to glory, where's Moses? I want to shake his hand. How about Peter? I'd like to see Peter. And then there's Paul. And then after I've gone through all of the apostles and all the prophets and all of the saints, where's the Lord? <laughs> yeah, because there's none greater than that one. Once you've met him, there's, no, there's, no further, there's nowhere else to go. You've met the greatest of them all. But I'm going to tell you something. God's got to get you ready before you meet Christ. That's right. Amen. Just Isaiah chapter number six, and you'll get an idea of, uh, of what you're going to be coming before. When you come before the Lord Jesus Christ. My, 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 my. <laughs> I want you to look at the book of Malachi, chapter number four and verse five. Malachi. Now, Malachi is the last book of the Old Testament written before what's called the time between the Testaments or the time when there was no direct revelation from God, which is not necessarily really true because during the time of the Maccabees, God was revealing himself and he was speaking to people. He, wrote, he raised up certain leaders, but no scripture was written. And that's what's important. No scripture. Uh, apocryphal books, yes, all kinds of it's out there. But no scripture. The last book of the canon of scripture is Malachi. And the first book in order as we have it now is Matthew in the New Testament. And here's what it says in Malachi. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. He shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children, the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. Now notice carefully. What's he going to do? He's going to bring them back to God. See that? That's the ministry of Elijah. Now, right now, if you go to Israel, you're going to find, first of all, a bunch of atheists. I was watching a thing from Brooklyn the other night, the uh, uh, Hasidic community in Brooklyn, New York, numbers over 100,000. That's a lot of people. And this is their community. They, they're, their blocks, their place. And all you see are these, are these uh, pork abstaining, Sabbath keeping Jews with the curls around their, uh, their head and the black hats and so forth. But one had a, 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 a round hat. How many's ever seen the round hat? Yeah. You ever see it? I often wondered, and I read somewhere some time ago said, well, this is how they identify the group they're with. They identify it by the hat they wear. And the person that was walking through the street asked him, said, well, I hate to think how much you paid for that. You must have paid $1,000 for a hat like that. <laughs> he said, no, I paid $5,500 for it. And he said, you did. He said, yes, it cost me $5,500. 
He continued to talk to him and he said, you know, he said, people misunderstand us. This, this fellowship we have with each other is first family, then faith. In other words, we identify with each other as family, then faith. There are a lot of people in this world that identify themselves as Jews, but they're atheists. Now think about that. Think about that for a moment. If you go to Israel, you're going to find every stripe, every kind you can think of. But here's, here's what's going on, as much, best I can tell, in a lot of Judaism. And that is the Talmud has brought Israel to a place where everything in the Bible is spiritualized. A few of them really take it literal. Okay? But then it's not only the Talmud, there's Kabbalah. Kabbalah, Kabbalah. How many has ever heard of Kabbalah? Kabbalah is a big deal. It's really moving now again in Israel. Kabbalah. And they're jumping on board. And now Kabbalah is even worse than the Talmud because you get off into New Age mysticism. The Tree of Life and Sephirot and all of that stuff. It's just like you can go into any pagan shrine in the world and there's not a dime's worth of difference between the Kabbalah and what they're doing. So what's happened to Israel? They've lost touch with God. That's what's happened to them. They need an Elijah, don't they? They need an Elijah. They need Elijah to bring them, turn them back to God. Now, I want you to look at Matthew chapter number 11 and verse number 12. Matthew eleven twelve. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence. Now, let's stop just a moment because this would be a great help for you. The Bible says the kingdom of God, he said, some of you standing here will not see death until the kingdom of God, till they see the kingdom of God. All right. The kingdom of God is not one event. The kingdom of God is a kingdom. Were there any people there on top of that mountain that saw the kingdom of God come? Yes, they did. They saw the glorified Lord Jesus Christ. And it wasn't anything about Israel, the land or anything. It had nothing to do with the land. It had to do with who Christ was. Because that's the first point, the basis and foundation of the kingdom of God. If you've never been born again, you can't even see the kingdom of God. But here's, notice it carefully. It says, John the Baptist, until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence. And the violent, here's important now, take it by force. Let me ask you a simple question. Do you believe there is anyone capable of taking the kingdom of God by force? Well, absolutely not. It's ludicrous. All right. Well, since that's true, and it is, how in the world do these guys go around and still teach people that there is no difference between the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God, that they're interchangeable and they're talking about the same thing? And once again, they're good people. I know some of them. They love the Lord. I don't doubt their dedication to God one bit. But they say there's no difference. Yes, there is a vast difference. And that difference is this. One is a physical kingdom. The other one is a spiritual kingdom. And the spiritual kingdom is the kingdom of God. They can run together simultaneously on this earth at the same time. Yes, they can. They can be, they can be, things can be happening at the same time by the power and authority of both of them. Yes, it can happen. But now, do you think that Israel is ruling, that the Messiah is ruling through Israel over this earth? Well, of course not. He, of course not. For that matter, you, you have to get into amillennial and postmillennial doctrine to believe that Christ is ruling anywhere over this earth. He's not ruling over this world. He's seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come, and he will take the kingdoms of this world, and they will become his, and he'll take them by force when he comes as the King of kings and Lord of lords. But look now again at Matthew chapter number 11 and verse 12. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. The Bible says the law and the prophets until John. But since that time, the kingdom of heaven is preached. Every man presseth into it. And if you will receive it, now watch this, folks. If ye will receive it, this is who? 
This is Elijah. This is simply a New Testament. This is Elijah, which was for to come. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. Now we're getting in to the actual nuts and bolts of how to understand the Bible. I was reading a website today by uh, atheist. Uh, I, I did a little research into, um, into what atheists have to say. And it's, it's, in some cases, it's so sad. Here's one argument from an atheist. Look at all the death and the dying. You ever sat by the bedside of a child, watch it suffer and die? You know, why killing here, why there, why all this suffering, why all this pain? If there's a God, why does he allow all this to happen? That's one argument. Another argument of atheism is, uh, look, at, look, if, uh, if, there's, if there truly is a God, what, what's the purpose in all of this? Where's all this going? What, what are we doing here? I mean, you know, what, what's happening? And that's a good argument. If you don't know the Lord, what are we doing here? What's the point? You understand? That's, that's an argument. Another argument from atheism for atheism is uh, one said, I can only believe what I know physically that I can touch, I can hear, I can smell, I can taste. And some of the scientists are like that. They say, that's all there is. There is no God. There is no spirit world. When you're dead, you're dead. And that's it. That's an argument for atheism. The truth of the matter is, there's not an atheist that has ever walked the face of this earth that would ever bother to look off into eternity and say, you know, there could be an awful lot all going on out there that we don't know about. And there could be a lot happening right here that we're totally unaware of. And there is. Make no mistake about it. Just a few days from now, people will die at the hands of some murdering witch or Satanist or something. Kids play with it. Kids are playing. That's all it is to them, Halloween. But to some of them, it is a deadly serious business. All Hallows Eve. Halloween. And so the atheist always has some reason why he doesn't believe in God. Always. Some kind of a reason why he doesn't believe in God. And there's one man that has pastored churches all over the place. He's been in a, he's, he started churches, pastored churches. And when you read, I read his testimony today. It's one of the saddest things you ever read. Now he says he's an atheist. Quit church. And, and he's out here now uh, preaching atheism. Um, you, know, you know, folks, life can be hard. It can get real hard. And I, some folks live a long time before they're really thrown into the furnace. But when you carry that mom's body or that dad's body out to the graveyard, and that's the first real loss you've ever had, welcome to the world. Welcome to this world. That's right. Welcome to this world. But you see, there are kids that are born into situations to where from day one, all they've ever known is hell on this earth. It's all they've ever known. Just pure, unadulterated hell in their lives. A lot of kids like that. And more and more in America because of drug addiction. Yes, there is. What you need to do is get on your knees and say, Lord, I believe. He that cometh to God must believe that he is. And then that he is reward of them that diligently seek him. Cry out to him and say, Lord God, I believe you're there, but show me something. I need some help. Move in my spirit. And he can move in your spirit. I wouldn't be here tonight if he hadn't done that with me to begin with. I would never have been saved probably if God had not moved in my spirit. And he brought me into conviction. And you've heard me tell it a thousand times. I don't have to go through all that again. But I could not have lived long in the shape I was in being convicted the way I was. Where'd that come from? I never claimed to be an atheist, but I was, I was an agnostic. I didn't believe, you know, maybe there's a God, maybe there's a man upstairs, maybe there's a supreme being, all that junk. That's essentially what I was until God saved me. So when Moses and Elijah show up, 
Their purpose is to bring Israel back to God. Oh, how I wish tonight that God would bring the church back to God. Don't you? I got two letters today, two emails today from Canadians. <laughs> back to back. Canadians. We get a lot of uh, correspondence from Canadians. They're good people. A lot of people in Canada love the Lord. They're good people. We've had a lot of them visit with us here at Temple. And they both said the same thing. They said, this is a godless, wicked, satanic place. They hate Christ. Said the only thing you hear in churches are about how awesome and wonderful you are and how that God has a, such a great blessing that if you just know the key, he'll pour it all out upon you. And that's sad because they don't, you know, that's all over this country too. The same thing. A lot of people talk about a revival. Wouldn't a revival be good? But a revival scare most people to death. A real revival. I mean a real revival. One of the marks of a real revival is when people begin to bear their soul. Yeah. Oh, I know they'll shout and jump up and down. That shouting and jumping's fine, but that's not the revival. The Apostle Paul talked about that revival over there in the book of Corinthians, and he said, what burying of the soul it brought. Repentance and gotten right with God and renewed faith and renewed power in your life. I'd like to see that, wouldn't you? That'd be a wonderful thing. It would be. But that can only come from God. But let me tell you this, you can have revival in your own life. His disciples asked him, Matthew 17, Why then say the scribes that Elias must first come? Jesus answered and said to them, Elias truly shall first come and restore all things. All right, you got it. That's the surface. That's the surface reading, okay? That's a cursory reading of what's going on here. What does that mean? That means I'm simply reading the words in context as they come across. I'm not trying to dig any deeper. I'm, ta I'm simply taking a straight statement. Here's the statement. Elias shall first come and restore all things. You believe that? Well, certainly I believe the Bible. Now watch this though. Watch this. You see, this is where the atheist never bothers with the Bible. He always skims the surface of it and then accuses God. So watch this. But I say unto you that Elias is come already and they knew him not, but have done unto him whatsoever they listed. Likewise shall also the Son of Man suffer of them. In other words, out of ignorance. Then the disciples understood that he spake unto them of what? All right. That opens up the Bible. You remember what I told you about Isaiah 61? Look at Isaiah 61, verse 1. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings to the meek, sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. Watch this now. To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, the year of Jubilee, and the day of vengeance of our God. Boy, follows right. Nothing but a comma. That comma represents 2,000 years. How do I know that? In Luke chapter number 4, verse 17, the Lord Jesus stands up and interprets the Scripture. He opens the Bible to them. He does. We don't have the authority to do that. See, I wouldn't have the authority to do what he did. But he opened up the Scriptures. Look how he did it. In Luke chapter 4, verse 17, And there was delivered in him the book of the prophet Esaias, and when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised. Now watch this. To preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book. Well, you go back to Isaiah chapter number 61. It's right there. He hadn't even finished the sentence. All you got is a comma. Go ahead and finish the sentence. You can't finish that sentence because there's a 2,000 year interval in that comma. Do you know why that's important? Because that's how you rightly divide the word of truth. Amen. Never take the Bible and compare it to some event and say, well, the Bible must be wrong. 
because this happened. No, the Bible's not wrong. The Bible is the word. It's a living word of God. You've got to rightly divide the word of truth. So here's the two things I brought up to you tonight. Two very important things when interpreting scripture. Number one, one person, a person can become another person to fulfill Bible prophecy. We just read it, didn't we? John the Baptist could have been Elijah. Watch, number two, watch scripture very carefully in context. Context, Isaiah 61. All right. The Lord hath anointed me to come and preach. The Lord Jesus Christ quotes that. 700 years later, he quotes that scripture. I don't know how many times they probably read that in the synagogue because it was certainly popular. The book of Isaiah was a very popular book. Around 250 B.C., up probably 500 years after it was originally written, there was a 57 foot long copy made of the book of Isaiah. It was found among the Dead Sea Scrolls. Now the scrolls, of course, they're not books like ours, they're scrolls. And 57 feet long, this, this Isaiah that the so-called Essenes had agrees with the Isaiah you've got in your Bible. You see that? Why would they have that? They'd have that because that was a very popular, powerful prophet of the Old Testament. That's why. And so when the Lord Jesus took it, opened it up, and he read it, he got to the point to where the day of vengeance of our God, he didn't read it. He shut the book. You know why? Because the day of vengeance of our God has not come yet. And it will come. And when it comes, it'll come in a way that it's never come before. When you read the book of Revelation, you'll get, a, you'll get an understanding of what I'm talking about. It is the day of the wrath of the Lamb. All judgment has been given to the Lamb. And I'll finish with these two apostles, Peter and John. Peter said, we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory. This is Peter speaking firsthand as a firsthand witness of what happened on top of that mountain. And the, and the, and the, and the voice said, This is my beloved Son, whom I am well pleased. This voice came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. But then he says, We have a more sure word of prophecy. And you know what that sure word of prophecy is? It's the Bible. It's alive. Every time you open the Bible, you're opening up a living book. It's alive. You'll read it and it'll read you. First John says this, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. For the life was manifested, and we've seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life, which was with the Father, and was manifested unto us. What's, what's, what's John saying? He's saying the same thing Peter said. I knew him. I touched him. I was with him. We sat by the campfire every night. I watched him die on the cross. He was buried, and he rose again the third day. And now he is eternal life. And notice the way it says it. The New Testament does. And I'll close with this, because I love this. He didn't say he gives you eternal life. He is eternal life. He didn't say he gives you righteousness. He is your righteousness. <laughs> That's the point. All of these perfections that come out of the Old Testament come to one person. And the Lord Jesus Christ becomes everything God ever required of anyone in the Old Testament the Lord Jesus Christ is all of that and more when you have the Son. Hallelujah to God. I feel sorry for an atheist. Do you know why? A mosquito looks and makes him look like a fool. Mosquitoes, I was sitting on the swing the other day and I felt something. I looked over there, you sorry low down thing. <laughs> sucking my blood. I mean, wasn't it <laughs> sucking my blood? <laughs> And, but the thing is, if it just stuck its bill down in there and started sucking your blood, it, it, it would coagulate and 
First thing you know, you couldn't get any more blood, right? That is one smart mosquito. <laughs> he figured out a substance to shoot down in there to keep that blood thin so he could draw it up. Now, buddy, that's a smart mosquito, don't you think? And I don't think they know to this day what that is that he does that with. And then there's the fish. He's swimming around. And here's this thing up on a branch above the water. Okay? He's up above the water. This fish swims around. All of a sudden, he rises up to the surface of the water, reaches up there and grabs that thing. You say, well, that's simple. No, it's not. If you get under the water and you look up at something like that, you're looking through a refraction. I guess that's what you'd call it. In plain words, it's not a straight shot. That fish has to know that it has to go at an angle to get that bug or whatever that is. Smart fish, folks. Smart mosquitoes. They're smart. And then there's the rattlesnake. The rattlesnake. He shakes his tail and rattles, warn you if you're getting around him. And But if he lays his fangs into you, he'll inject a poison into your system. Okay? Where did he get that poison? How many billions of years did it take him to figure out the poison that he would need to sink his fangs in? He didn't do it, did he? Somebody made that snake, didn't they? Somebody made that mosquito. Somebody made that fish. It shows the majesty and the glory and the power of the Creator. Just watch the creation. It'll blow your mind. It's amazing. Just watch it. And, it, and two of the most beautiful things in the world, people are sitting around, they're watching TV, they're doing this and they're doing that, in the morning and in the evening. Not every morning, but some mornings you go out there, but and here comes this beautiful fire coming up over the sky, color shooting out all over the place. And I mean, especially if you go down around the ocean. Now that's where you see the, the sunrise and the sunset. Now here's this beautiful picture. And then again that night, you see them. Beautiful picture. And you hear there. <laughs> you got you got remote itis. <laughs> Father, bless your word. Thank you for what you've given us. And then, Lord, thank you, thank you, thank you that you gave me enough sense to see it and bless tonight. In Jesus' name, Amen. amen. All right.